So right now we're going to start looking at partial fraction decomposition. And so this is where we're looking at a complicated fraction and being able to rewrite it as a sum or difference of simpler fraction. And so this is helpful when you get into calculus and being able to integrate or differentiate. Sometimes you don't want something very complicated. It gets really messy, but if we can rewrite it as a sum or difference of something that's simpler, it makes our life really easy. So it really depends on how, our, um, how your denominator factors, depends on how you're going to rewrite your fraction. So rewriting. A rational um, in terms how do I say that? Rewriting a how about this? A single fraction. as a sum or a difference of simpler fractions. So let's say we have some P of X all over Q of X. Q of X can be factored in terms of linear and or reducible quadratics. So we looked at being able to factor different polynomials and rewriting it in terms of linear and or quadratic factors where that wasn't reducible over the real numbers. And so that's what we want to do with our denominator. And depending on what type of factors we have depends on how we're going to rewrite that. So if you have a factor is a linear factor that does not repeat itself rewrite the fraction the following way Okay, so for instance, so let's say we had our polynomial P of X all over Q of X. You factored the denominator. So let's just keep it as P of X up here. And you found that you had different linear factors. So let's say X minus A, X minus B, dot, 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 X minus, it doesn't matter, in. Okay, so you have a certain number of factors down on the denominator. They're all linear and they don't repeat itself. Then what, how we're going to rewrite this what? is capital A over the first linear factor, X minus little a, whatever that factor was, plus B, all over X minus B, little b, plus dot, 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 uh, oh. Capital N all over X minus N. Okay, so this is only if it's repeating itself or not repeating itself and their linear factors. If a factor repeats itself,
around is linear. Then you're going to rewrite the fraction or rewrite that piece as follows. So let's say that you factored this P of X over Q of X and you saw, and I'm just going to look at an example where, let's say that you had a factor of X minus A and it repeated itself in times. If I'm going to rewrite this, I'm going to look at A all over X minus A plus B all over X minus A squared plus C all over X minus A cubed all the way up until I get to what N is, how many factors I have. So if it was just a square down here, I would have had just these two fractions. If it's a fifth power, I would have five different fractions for this piece. So plus dot, 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 till we get to the nth factor, x minus a over n. OK, so that's if it's a repeating linear factor. If it's an irreducible, um, quadratic factor. So if the denominator has a irreducible quadratic factor, that does not repeat itself. So there's only one factor of that quadratic. If it's that way, then this P of X all over Q of X. So let's say you factored it and you found that you had um, ax squared plus bx plus c down here as one of your factors or multiple but not the same. What you would do instead when we write our fraction we have to look at it as ax plus b all over this quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c. So if the irreducible quadratic repeats itself, then you're going to rewrite the fraction the following way. So if we had P of X over Q of X, you factored Q of X and you found that you had a quadratic that was irreducible. So let's say AX squared plus BX plus C. And you had N factors of those. So kind of similarly to what we did in part, the one above and when the linear factor repeat itself. To rewrite this, we have to go up to how many we have um, in of those repeating factors. We need n separate um, sums of fractions, n, n fractions. So if this is quadratic, so I have to put the numerator as in the form of a linear equation, ax plus b, all over the first ax squared plus bx plus c. Plus, well, this is a different linear equation. I don't know if those coefficients are the same, so I'm just going to call it cx plus b all over ax squared plus bx plus c quantity squared. So if this was cubed, I have to do another one. So plus numerator ex plus f. And I would do this until I got up to what n was. 
AX squared plus BX plus C cubed, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so this, I'm just telling you how to rewrite things. We haven't figured out what these, these fraction or equivalent fractions would be. Um, so let's first look at some pieces. So find the partial fraction decomposition of the rational. Let's see. Determine whether the given rational expression is proper or improper. If the expression is improper, rewrite it in the sum of a polynomial. Okay. The other thing that I forgot to say is that P of X and Q of X, when we're looking at that rational um, function, you have to look at the numerator and denominator. If the degree of our denominator is smaller or equal to the degree of our numerator, then we can use some long division. If the degree of the denominator is smaller than or equal to degree of the numerator first rewrite the Rewrite the fraction. As the quotient. After the long division plus three main third. the divisor. And then once we've done that, we're going to apply this partial fraction decomposition to this piece. Let's just go through and, and do some. So let's say you started and you had 3x all over x plus 2 all over x minus 1. And it says find the partial fraction decomposition of each rational expression. So it's already factored in the denominator. If it wasn't factored in the denominator, that's where you would start. Once you've factored in the denominator, we want to rewrite it. Um, and so x plus 2 is a linear factor, and it only appears once in the denominator. So to rewrite that piece, I'm going to write it as just a constant a all over x plus 2. So now I go to my next factor in my denominator. And I see I have a factor of x minus 1. 
It only appears in here once, and so I can write this in the form of b all over x minus 1. So once you've done that, we really only care about what A and B are. If I sum this together, right, um, I'd have to get a common denominator. And, and then I could just set my numerator equal to my numerator P. Well, how we can get that is we can just, we are a fraction. So once you've rewritten it as a sum using the rules as what type of factor in the denominator it is, then you want to clear your fraction by multiplying by the LCD or by x plus 2 all um, over x minus 1. LCD is going to be what this denominator is here. So clear the fraction. By multiplying by the LCD. So I'm going to multiply this side and I'm going to multiply this side by x plus 2 all times x minus 1. And so when I distribute it on the left, my fraction goes away and I'm just left with my numerator of 3x. This is equal to, well when I distribute it to the right hand side of the equation, my x plus 2's cancel and I'm left with a all times the factor that was missing there, which I would have gotten if I got a common denominator, which was x minus 1. So distributing it to my next fraction on the other side of the equation, you get plus, well this time the x minus 1's cancel, and you're left with b all times the factor of x plus 2. So let me just show you the way that you, it always works, but I'm going to give you a tr maybe a trick later on, which will help you. But let me give you the way that we normally do this so it kind of explains why. So let's distribute our A. And let's sub distribute your B. And so let's rewrite our equation now after we di distribute it. We get 3x is equal to ax minus a plus bx plus 2b. So normally I don't do this piece, but let's do it now again so I can kind of explain why we're setting up the equations we're going to. Let's regroup it where our x terms are together and our constants, the values without the x are together. And so if we do that, we get 3x is equal to ax plus bx uh, minus a plus 2b. And let's factor out this x. So if we factor out that x on that one side, so we have 3x is equal to a plus b minus a plus 2b. So basically, once you've gotten to this point where you have multiplied by your LCD after you've written out the sum of your fractions in the form that it told us above, um, you would get this where your denominator fell away. You're looking at the coefficients in front of your, your uh, variable and matching them up with the coefficients on the other side of the equation that match up with that variable. For instance, here, we're looking at 3 is the coefficient in front of my x term. So in order for this 
equation to be equivalent, when I sum a and b, that must be 3, because that would give us 3x over here. And so we're going to set up a system of equations. And one of our systems of equations is that 3 is equal to a plus b. The terms that don't have x, those are our constant. And so notice over here, there's no constant. I'm not adding any term here that doesn't have a variable x. So my constant on this left-hand side of the equation is 0. So we can think of this as plus 0 if you want. So my value of 0 here has to equal my constant on the other side. So 0 is my other equation, must equal what negative a plus 2b is. So solve the system. For a and b. Once we get that, we know what a is up here, we know what b is up here, and that would be the decomposition of this main fraction that we started with. So you can use um, whatever method you want to use to solve the system. Um, sometimes it's actually easier when we use matrices, when you have more variables and more equations we're solving for. But looking at this, I can tell right away that I can use my addition method and A would go away. So let's just do that. So if I added my first equation, row one plus row two, this would give me three plus zero is three, equals A plus negative A is zero, B plus two B is three B. So I can figure out that dividing both sides by three, we get B is equal to one. So you want to go back in and do a substitution. And it doesn't matter which one equation you decide to substitute in what b. So if I plugged it into the first equation, I would have 3 is equal to a plus b, but b in my case is 1. So if I subtract 1 on both sides, I get 2 is equal to a. So our equation 3x all over x plus 2 times x minus 1 can be rewritten as our a value, which is 2, all over the factor of x plus 2 plus the um, factor b, which is 1, um, all over x minus 1. I meant to say fraction. Okay, so if you went backwards like we normally do, get a common denominator, um, and then combine like terms in your numerator, you'll see that you get 3x over this. Just get a new piece of paper. So here you're given the equation 7x plus 3 all over x cubed minus 2x squared. minus 3x. And it is asking you to rewrite this in terms 
of a summer difference of um, rational expressions. So find the partial fraction decomposition of each rational expression. Okay, the other one, it was already done for us. And this isn't. First step you have to do is get this polynomial that's in our denominator into factors of linear and or quadratic, the quadratic irreducible over the reals. So we first need to factor. So if we factor that denominator, notice first they all have a term in common, or they each have a, the x in common, so we can pull the x out. If we do that, you'd be left with x squared minus 2x minus 3. Our numerator, we are still have the 7x plus 3. I need to see if the quadratic is reducible or factorable over the reals. And our, there are two numbers that multiply to negative 3 and add to negative 2, that middle term. So we can say this is the same thing as 7x plus 3 all over x. And the two numbers that multiply to negative 3 and add to negative 2 are negative 3 and positive 1. So the down denominator is now equal to x all times the factor x minus 3 times the factor x plus 1. So we're already to the point where we can now rewrite this in terms of a sum or a difference. So looking at the different types of factors. And so if I look at my factor of x, that is only occurring once in here. So it's a, a linear factor and it's occurring once. So I'm going to write that form as a all over x. I guess I'm going to write this over here on the side. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my next factor in my denominator. I notice it's x minus 3. It's only appearing once. x minus 3 is linear. So to rewrite this fraction, I'm going to have b all over x minus 3. Go to my next factor, x plus 1. It's linear. It's only appearing once. So I write it in the form of c all over x plus 1. So we want to clear the fractions, multiply through by the LCD. And we can only do this is because we have an equation. If this was just an expression, you can't clear your fractions. So multiply by LCD to clear the fractions. And so when we do that, we're just left with our numerator, which is the 7x plus 3 on the left-hand side of the equation, is equal to a times, we'll figure out what pieces are left, what's missing. Well, the x piece would have canceled when we multiplied by the LCD, but we would have been left with the x minus 3 and the x plus 1. plus b all times um, what would have canceled out when I multiply by the LCD. x minus 3 would have canceled, but we would have been left with the x times x plus 1. And then plus c times what would have been left once we distributed the LCD, x plus 1s would have canceled, and you would have been left with an x and a x minus 3. Okay, so we need to go in here, we need to distribute this out, then we need to determine which coefficients match up. 
So coefficients in front of the x squared term have to match up with x squared terms here. Coefficients in front of the x terms have to match up, et cetera, constant, constant. So I can only see that if I distribute that out. So this would be 7x plus 3 is equal to a. If we distribute x minus 3 times x plus 2 and combine like terms, well, x times x is x squared. Here we have a 1x minus a 3x, so minus 2x, and a negative 3 times 1, so minus 3. So let's distribute. We can do it at the same time. Let's distribute this bx. So we have a bx um, times an x is a bx squared. And we have a bx times a plus 1. So it's just bx plus bx. Same idea, just to kind of save time, I guess it's not a huge deal, but let's distribute the CX, the CX term into this parentheses all at once. So CX times X is CX squared, so plus CX squared. And CX times a negative three, that would give you a negative three CX. Isn't there supposed to also be a BX or uh, just a B? Um, no, because we got to distribute the B inside the parentheses. And if you distribute a BX, because really B times X is BX to X, that's BX squared and BX times the one is BX. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so now distribute the A, I think so, because it's possible I could have done something. I missed it or left it out by mistake. Distribute that A there. So technically notice over here, the, the um, degree, the largest value of our X exponent is two. There's no X squared over here. So if you want to, you can think of this as zero X squared, right? Plus seven X plus three equals and if we distribute this a into both all three terms in the parentheses, we get a times x squared is ax squared. We got a times negative 2x is negative 2ax. We get a times negative 3 is negative 3a. And then let's bring down all the other pieces. So plus the bx squared, plus the bx, plus the cx squared minus the three CX. So we're going and we're matching up coefficients. So the coefficient in front of the X squared zero has to equal the sum of if we had multi or added AX squared plus BX squared plus CX squared. So if I summed A plus B plus C, all the X squared terms, I have to get back zero X squared. So we know then that A plus B plus C has to equal zero. So now let's look at seven X. So when we sum things on the other side, just the X terms, we must back, get back seven as the coefficient in front of that X term. So we just have to look at the coefficients. So we need seven to equal the same thing as, so just go through the equation on the other side and pick out all the coefficients in front of X with a sign. So it has to equal negative two A. It has to equal over here, here's another X term, plus B. And then another X term here is minus three C. And so now going and picking out the constants. So going and seeing which constants are in here. My constant on the left is three. So this has to sum, if I added all the constants over here, I have to get back three. So those are all the terms without the X. And so that's a negative three A. Um, is that it? 
Woohoo, that's it. That's nice. Because then things start to fall out really nicely because we know what A is. So looking at this system of equation now, we have to figure out what A, B, and C are. Because of that last equation, we can tell right away that A then is dividing both sides by negative three is negative one. So now let's go back. We can rewrite A into both of these equations. Just gonna do it right here for a second. So our first equation is zero is equal to a, which is negative one, plus b plus c. Our second equation, replacing a with negative one, we get seven is equal to negative two times our a value plus b plus c. So we have two equations left with two unknowns. So let me kind of simplify this. So our first equation, maybe let's isolate B and C on one side of the equal sign. Let's add one to both sides. And so doing that, we would get B plus C is equal to one. If negative two times negative one is positive two, so if I subtract two on both sides, I would get b plus c on the other side is equal to seven minus two is five. Did we do something wrong? Shouldn't it be negative oh, oh, three c? Oh, yeah, thank you. I knew something was off again. At least I noticed uh, minus three c. Okay, so that would have been minus 3c. I knew something was off because if we would have summed the, uh, or subtracted one of the equations off the other, we would have gotten a false statement. I didn't know that wasn't gonna happen. So seven minus two is five. Okay. So we can use, I would use my addition method where I would look at maybe row one minus row two. So B minus B cancels. C minus a three C. Well, C minus a negative. So C plus three C is four C is equal to one plus five, which is six. And so, oops, nope. I'm subtracting it off. One minus five is negative four. Divide both sides by four. We get C equals negative one. And so now we can figure out what B is. So maybe if we plugged it into the first equation or this equation right here. If you do that, we get B minus one equals one. and add one to both sides, we get B equals two. Okay, so we figured out what A, B, and C are. So we got A was negative one, B was two, and C was negative one. And so A was over our X. So negative one over X plus B was over our X minus three. So two over X minus three. Minus one over X plus one. 
So technically I would probably pull this negative out front and make it a minus, or I can do plus a the negative in my numerator. So final answer, negative one over x plus two over x minus three minus one over x plus one. So it kind of ties in a lot of what we've been doing this semester. Okay, so here's a trick. But I wanted you to kind of know the reasoning behind why we were setting up these systems of equations and why those coefficients had to match up um, with the variables or the coefficients in front of the variables. If you have linear factors like this, um, choose different values for x. Choose values, a value for x, which is going to cancel things out. So let's go back to this one piece here. And maybe I can grab it. Let's see. Let's see if it works. It might have been faster just to rewrite it. Okay, so going back to the point. Come on, you should erase in here. Okay, maybe not. You're going to choose some value for x so that your factors are going to go away. So look at when x minus 3 is 0. If we chose x to be 3 here, and we went in and we plugged this in, then we would have the following. So wherever we see an x, we're going to replace it with 3. So we have and so I'm just going to put parentheses wherever I see an x in this equation. So 7 parentheses plus 3 equals a, um, parentheses, and then a parentheses for our x minus 3, and parentheses, parentheses, I see an x, so parentheses plus 1 plus b all times x, so parentheses, parentheses, see an x, parentheses plus 1 plus c. I see an x, parentheses, parentheses, I see an x, parentheses, minus 3. Okay, so we chose that value. So that factor, one of those factors, or multiple of those factors actually, go to zero. And so notice three minus three is zero. And if you multiply anything by zero, we get back zero, right? And so by doing that, this whole thing goes away now. Because that's zero times a times four. Notice over here, this three minus three in this factor also is equals zero. So when you multiply this zero times the three times the c, this whole piece also goes away. And so really what we're left with on this left-hand side is 7 times 3, which is 21, plus 3. So we get 24. Is equal to 
b times well three order of operations and we'll add inside times four so 24 is equal to 12b divide both sides by two i'm sorry 12 which you would get back to so b is two notice we got b was two here So do the same exact thing, but now choose a different value for x that is going to clear out some of those factors and just leave one of your variables you're solving for. So if we had chosen x to be zero, because this factor here, that's going to go to zero. So if we go back in and wherever we see an X, we replace it with zero. So seven times zero plus three equals A times zero minus three, all times zero plus one, plus B times zero, zero plus one, plus C times zero, and zero minus three. The whole point of that again was so that things would cancel out. We chose x equals zero, so this zero times one times b goes away. And this zero times c times negative three goes away. So we're left with the left hand side, seven times zero plus three is three, equals a times negative three times one. So three equals negative three a. Divide both sides by negative three, we get A is negative one, which was what we got doing it the other method. Last but not least, I would choose one more value for X so that I could figure out what C is. So if we chose C, um, to figure out what C is, let's see. I don't want a three, I don't want a zero. It's the other factor that's gonna clear the other ones, which is negative one. So really I showed you the step, but you can kind of skip some stuff. If I let X equals negative one, let's just go over here and write it in. So seven times negative one is negative seven plus three is negative four. Then our new equation is negative four equals, well the negative one, if I plug it in, that's gonna get rid of this piece because that makes that go to zero. Negative one is gonna get rid of this piece with a B in it, because that makes this X plus one go to zero. And so really all we're left with is this C, all times X, which is negative one, all times parentheses, you see X, replace it with negative one minus three. So we get negative four equals C times Negative one minus three is negative four. Negative four times negative one up front here is negative four. If we divide both sides, sorry. This is negative four times this negative one right here is positive four. Divide both sides by four, we get C equals negative one, which is also the value we got for C up there. So it's just a shortcut way. It doesn't always work. Um, you might have some quadratic irreducible factors. You might have something that appears there more than once. So this is a trick that doesn't always work, but if it does work, it can actually go a lot faster. And you may, or you don't have to use it, but I'm not gonna dock you if you wanna use it. Okay, I don't like it when my pen gets skinny. So just giving me, giving myself a new page kind of just deletes that problem. Let's see, what else do we wanna do? I wanna show you where you have re, um, repeating factors.
or an irreducible factor. Um, here's an example. Um, partial fraction decomposition. So let's say you had x squared plus x in the numerator, and this is all divided by x plus 2. It was with one factor, and then the factor x minus 1 quantity squared. Okay, so it's already factored for us, so we don't have to do that. And so now we want to rewrite it depending on the type of factors we have. So x plus 2 is a linear factor, and it's only in there once, so we're going to rewrite that as a over x plus 2. Plus, so x minus 1 is a factor, and it's occurring twice, so we're going to need two separate fractions for this piece. And so let's do b over x minus 1 plus c over x minus 1 squared. So if this was a cube, then we would have a d over x minus 1 cubed. If that's had in a fourth power, we keep going on. So we've rewritten it using the directions that it told us to with what type of factor we had on the, in the denominator. If you now multiply by your LCD, then you're going to just be left with your numerator over here, x squared plus x equals, so we have our a value here. So the missing piece, so if we multiply through by x plus 2 times x minus 1 quantity squared, um, you have an x minus 1 quantity squared left with it times the a. Plus b, when we distribute the LCD to this term, x one of the x minus 1 cancels, and so you'll be left with a x minus 1 and an x times an x plus 2 plus c. And so now if we multiply this c over x minus 1 quantity squared by the LCD, the x minus 1 squares cancel, and you're just left with the x plus 2 factor. So we could try the shortcut if we want. So let's say we let a, uh, x be 1. So if we let x equal 1, this left-hand side of our equation, 1 squared plus 1, is 2, is equal to, this 1 minus 1 cancels, so this would be a times 0, plus b, if I plug in 1 here, 1 minus 1 cancels, so b times some 0, plus c, and if I plug in 1 here, I get 1 plus 2, which is 3. So this tells me then that 2 has to equal 3c, or c is equal to 2 thirds. Okay, so choose another value for x so that you can do the same thing where one of them cancels. And so let's say x is equal to negative 2. So you got to go back in. Negative 2 squared is 4, and 4 minus 2, so maybe we should do that. is equal to a all times, plugging in negative 2 here, so negative 2 minus 1 quantity squared. But plugging in negative 2 with this piece with a b in here, we have b times something times 0. So that goes away, plus c all times negative 2 plus 2. So that's all times 0. So we get 4 minus 2 on the left equals a times negative 3 squared 
So we get two is equal to nine times A. So A is equal to two ninths, divided by nine on so both sides. The thing is this trick did not work with figuring out what B is. And so unfortunately, we have to go in and either plug in these values for A and C and figure out what B is, or we can go and do what we were just doing before. And so if we quickly do that, if I had distributed, so this would have been x squared plus x equals A all times boiling out x minus one times x minus one is x squared minus two x plus one plus B, if I foiled out x minus one times x plus two distributing, I would get, and simplifying, x squared plus x minus two plus C all times x plus two. So I have x squared plus x equals, distribute my A, so AX squared minus two AX plus A distribute my b, so I get bx squared plus bx minus 2b, and distribute your c, you get cx plus 2c. So looking at coefficients in front of the x squared is 1 on the left hand side. So this one has to be equal to the coefficients and of summing in front of the x squared has to sum to one. So we know that a plus b has to equal one. Looking at the coefficients in front of x, we have one is in front of x. So one must equal negative 2a plus b plus c. And my constant, my constant, there's no constant in here, so plus zero. So zero must equal a minus 2b plus 2c. If we did everything right, we actually know what a and c are from up here. So that tells me then that I can rewrite this. If I plug in a in here, I need to figure out what B is. That would give me B right away. So let's do that. If we plugged in A in here, maybe. We have one is equal to A, two ninths plus B. So if I subtract two ninths on both sides, so this is really a nine ninths, 9 ninths minus 2 ninths is equal to B, so B is 7 ninths. So we have our fraction. This is equal to 2 ninths. all over x plus 2 plus b, which is all over x minus 1, plus c, which is all over x minus 1 squared. 
So C was two thirds. And B was seven ninths. Okay, we don't like complex fractions. And so we wanna kind of rewrite this. Think of it as invert multiplying if you want, because this is just a fraction over a fraction. And so flip it up. And this is the same thing as two all over nine times X plus two. Plus, so flip it up, we get seven all over nine times the quantity X minus one. Again, flip it up, so we get two all over three times X minus one quantity squared. Okay, so if we got a common denominator and we combine like terms, we should get back X squared plus X all over X plus two all times x minus one quantity squared. So let me give you one more. I wanted to give you one with a repeating quadratic that was irreducible. And so let's say you had x squared all over x squared plus four. And that x squared plus four is quantity squared. So I notice x squared plus four can't be reduced or factored over the real um, numbers. If you solve for x here, you would get plus or minus two i. Um, I noticed that too, I have a quadratic factor that's repeating. And so I'm gonna have to multiply or rewrite this factor um, with fraction with this twice. Quadratic, you write in the form of a linear on top, ax plus b, all over x squared plus four. But there's another factor of that, so I have to go further. So cx plus d, this would be over the factor of x squared plus four quantity squared. So I'm done with that piece. So we're going to now multiply through by your LCD. Your LCD, right, is x squared plus four quantity squared. So we're left with just x squared on the left equals We'll have this AX plus B, we need parentheses around that whole thing. When we multiply by the LCD, we're left with one factor of X squared plus four multiplied by our numerator. Plus, we multiply the second fraction on the right by our LCD, everything cancels in the denominator and you're just left with the numerator CX plus D. So we're gonna to have to distribute this AX plus B, that quantity times the quantity X squared plus four. So AX times X squared is AX cubed. AX times four, so that's plus four AX. Distribute my B, I get plus B squared, BX squared. B times four, so plus four B. And then let's just bring down the plus CX plus D. So notice there's no x cubed term. So we can think of this as zero x cubed plus. So zero would equal, only term over here that has a cubed is a x cubed. So a that falls out right away is zero. So now we're gonna look for our numbers in front of x squared. So numbers in front of x squared are one here equals, we have a 4a and we have a plus c, oops. And then our constant, notice there's no constant there. 
And so we can think of this as plus zero. So zero has to equal, oops, I forgot one. Sorry, I forgot. Um, this, there's no X term. And I was doing the X term. I didn't do the square term. The X term, think of this as plus zero X. So this is actually zero here is equal to negative four A plus C. The X squared term, that coefficient is one. And so the numbers in front of the X squared term, there's only one X squared term here, which is B. And then the constant, that was no constant on the left, so we said it was zero. And then the constants over here would be 4b and d. So zero equals 4b plus d. So we already have multiple ones. We know what a is, a is zero. We know what B is, B is one. So if we plug in A to the second equation for zero, I can see that doing that, C also is equal to zero. And then if I plug in one for B, so if we plug in one up here for B, I get four times one is four plus D. 4 plus d equals 0, so then d would have to be negative 4. So going back in and plugging in those numbers wherever we see a, b, c, and d in this expression. So we have a, which is 0 times x, that goes away plus b, but b is 1, so 1 over x squared plus 4, plus c, but c is 0, so 0 plus d, but d is negative 4. So if you don't mind, I'm going to put a minus in front of the fraction. So minus and then 4 in the numerator all over the denominator of x squared plus 4 quantity squared. Okay. Let me see if they have one in here where you have to do the long division. One more, one more. I know I said that last time. Um, and then we've gone through every type that you'll see. So, so you had x to the fourth plus x cubed minus x plus two. This is all divided by x squared minus two x plus one. Um, so use the division algorithm to rewrite the improper rational expression as a sum of polynomials and a proper rational expression. Find the partial fraction decomposition of the proper rational expression. Finally, express the improper rational expression as a sum of the polynomials and the partial fraction decomposition. Okay. Notice that our degree of our denominator is smaller than the degree of our numerator. So this polynomial, we can divide into the numerator. This is not in the form that we can use synthetic division because it's not in the form of x minus c that we're dividing by. 
So we have to use long division of polynomials. And so we have x squared minus 2x plus 1, and we're dividing this into x to the fourth plus x cubed minus x plus 2. Looking at the first term, you're looking at x squared, and you think to yourself, what do I multiply x squared by to get to x to the fourth? That's x squared. So distribute and put it below. So we get x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus, oops, I'm missing an x squared term. Well, let me just finish. So plus x squared. It's easier just to keep things lined up if you have a missing variable to put in the zero for that term. So instead of um, plus x cubed, then I would have a plus zero x squared oops, um, minus x minus two. Okay, so you're subtracting this whole piece off. So you're changing the signs and adding. So we have x to the fourth minus x fourth cancels. We have an x cubed minus a negative, so x cubed plus two x cubed is three. Isn't it plus two? Yep, plus two minus x, thank you. Um, so x cubed plus two x cubed is three x cubed. Zero x squared minus x squared, so minus x squared down my next term, negative x. Same sort of process. So you're looking at first term, what can you multiply x squared by to get 3x cubed? So 3x, distribute it. So 3x times x squared is 3x cubed. 3x times negative 2x is negative 6x squared. 3x times 1 is plus 3x. Subtract it off. So subtracting that whole thing off, we get 3x cubed minus 3x cubed cancels. Negative x squared, this is now plus 6x squared, is 5x squared. Negative x, now this is minus 3x, is minus 4x. Bring down the plus 2. So x squared times what is 5x squared? That's just five. Distribute, we get five x squared minus 10 x plus five. Subtract this off. So five x squares cancel. We have a negative four x. Now this is plus a 10 x, so that's a six x. And here we have two minus five, which is negative three or minus three. Okay, so our long division said that if we divide this into our um, numerator, we would get our quotient, which is x squared plus 3x plus 5 plus the numerator, or our remainder, 6x minus 3, all over this denominator, x squared minus 2x plus 1. So we've simplified things by this. We need to now go back. And now we're going to use a partial fraction decomposition just on this piece. Fraction decomposition. Just on the denominator? Um, just on the denominator with the numer I'm sorry, remainder over the divisor. And then we would keep this piece in here in front when after we rewrite this. So let's just kind of do that on the side. So 6x minus 3. You're going to have to factor the denominator. There are two numbers that multiply to positive 1 and add to negative 2. x minus 1 times x minus 1. 
So we could write this as x minus one quantity squared. Determine the type of factor on the bottom. Well, it's linear and it's repeating. So we would have a over x minus one and we would have plus b over x minus one squared. If we multiply two by the LCD, you get your numerator six x minus three equals a, well only one of the x minus ones cancel, so you're left with x minus one times that a, that quantity, plus b, both of the x minus one quantity squared cancels. So you're just left with b. So you got six x minus three equals a x minus a plus b. So coefficient in front of the x term is six. And we're looking at when is six equal to a. And the constant is negative three. So we're looking at when is negative three equal to negative a plus b. Well, right away, we can see what a is, a is six. So if we plug in six here, we get negative three equals negative, you see a there, so plug in six plus b. So we get negative three is equal to negative six plus b. So if we add six to both sides, we get b is three. So this piece right here, when we go back, we can rewrite this in even more simpler form, where this is equal to our quotient, x squared plus 3x plus 5, um, plus rewriting that remainder over our divisor, a, which is six, all over x plus one, plus b, which is three. That's not x plus one, it's x minus one. Plus b, which is three, all over x minus one squared. Okay, so if your again, if your denominator is smaller than the numerator or equal to, you have to do long division first, and then you're just working with the remainder over the divisor. Okay, so we've just finished chapter 12. You guys are almost there, three more sections. So let's take a break. And then we'll come back, we'll review for the test tomorrow. Um, let me pause the video. Okay, so we're getting ready for our next, next exam and that is covering um, polynomials, graphing polynomials, finding zeros of polynomials, the end behaviors of polynomials, solving log equation, exponential equations, finding inverses, um, domain range of functions and their inverses, graphs of functions and their inverses, and composition of functions. I think I might have gotten everything, but I'm just going to quickly kind of go through the back of your book page, actually not back of the book, back of the chapter. And this is on page 409, which you can access through the website if you wanted to go back and look at this, what I'm reading through. So from the following um, sections from this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Identify a polynomial and their degree. So looking at it, can you tell that that's a polynomial? What is that degree of that polynomial? Graph a polynomial function using transformations. Identifying the real zeros of a polynomial function and their multiplicity. 
So remember that multiplicity really helped us with a graph and is that graph gonna cross or just touch the x-axis at that zero? Um, 5.2, graph a polynomial function, graph a polynomial function using a graphing utility. Nope, you don't need to do that. Um, let me skip that. 5.3, find the domain of a rational function. So this is where we started graphing rational functions. Find the vertical asymptote of a rational function. Find the horizontal or oblique asymptote of a rational function. You should be able to graph a rational function. Um, then we got into solving polynomial inequalities, solving rational inequalities. Then we got into the remainder and factor theorem. Descartes rule of signs, which I just mentioned, you don't need to know, but if you did know, you can use it when you're trying to find a zero of a polynomial. You're gonna need to know the rational zero theorem and that lists the potential rational zeros of your polynomial you found that by all of um, P divided by Q. P were all your factors of your constant and Q were all your factors of your leading coefficient. Um, you should be able to solve a polynomial equation. You don't need to know this, but you can use it, the lower bound and upper bound theorem. You should be able to use or know the intermediate value theorem. Real quick, intermediate value theorem says if you have a con polynomial and you have let's say a is less than b and you plug those values into your function and you found f of a was a different sign than f of b then you knew one was positive one was negative if it's continuous it has to cross the x-axis so that means there's at least one x-intercept um, conjugate pair theorem and that says if you know that there is a complex zero of your polynomial and it has all real coefficients, then the conjugate is also a zero of the polynomial. You should be able to find a polynomial function with specified zeros. So given zeros of the polynomial, be able to give a function that has those zeros. Find a complex zero of a polynomial function. And that was chapter five. Okay. So any of that really strikes you like I need to go over that again? Can we do the polynomial rational inequalities? Rational inequalities, OK. Okay, so polynomial inequalities that are nonlinear are solved differently. So for instance, if you have the following, um, x cubed plus x squared is less than 4x plus 4. And it says solve each inequality, graph the solution set. Okay, so again, solving these nonlinear inequalities, we solve differently. Linear inequality, you just isolated the variable. Um, you just had to worry about if you multiplied or divided by a negative number, and that swatched the, the way your inequality was facing. Nonlinear inequalities, you want to get everything to one side of the inequality, and then we find what are called our critical numbers. And those are values which set it equal to zero. So if we got everything to one side of the inequality, let's subtract 4x and 4, we could rewrite this as x cubed plus x squared minus 4x minus 4. And we're looking at when is this less than zero? Technically, if we were looking at this function f of x and we let f of x just be this equation, our polynomial x cubed plus x squared minus 4x minus 4, 
the values where this is equal to zero, those are our x-intercepts or where it's crossing or touching the x-axis. And so that's why those are really our critical numbers when we're looking at this for um, if, when it is smaller than or bigger than zero because that's where it's going to be changing signs, our y values, um, at those values. And so we want to find our critical numbers or the values. And that's when x cubed plus x squared minus 4x minus 4 is equal to 0. So we can use different tools to help us, but we want to factor this. I notice that I have four terms in here, and I notice that factor by grouping is going to work. You have four terms. First, see if you can pull anything out of all four terms, which we cannot, and then see if factor group by grouping could help. So if we group the first two terms together and the last two terms together, and we pull out what's in common, we should have with those first two terms and last two terms, what's left in the parentheses should be the same, and it will be. So if we pull out an x squared from the first two terms, you're left with a x plus 1. And if we pull out a negative 4 from the last two terms, we'd be left with x plus 1 equals 0. So pulling out the parentheses x plus 1 from each one of those groupings, you're left with x squared minus 4 equals 0. So I notice x squared minus 4 can be factored further, the difference of squares, so we're going to rewrite that as x minus 2, x plus 2. And then when we set each piece equal to 0, those give us a critical numbers, x equals negative 1, x equals 2, and x equals negative 2. So notice that these factors where it's set equal to 0 only occurred once. The multiplicity is 1. So we actually know it's going to be crossing the x-axis there. So we can kind of bring that reasoning in when we're testing numbers if you want. If we had a multiplicity that occurred more than once, then we have to think as an odd or even. If it was even, then it's just going to touch it and come back around. Okay. So I think it's helpful just to put these on the number line. And then we want to test numbers on the left and the right to see if they're positive or negative. And if that's going to make our inequality true or false. So looking at the number line, smallest critical number was negative 2. Then I have negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And so we want to test something on the left of negative 2, something between negative 2 or negative 1, or use our reasoning about multiplicity, something between negative 1 and 2, and then something bigger than 2. And so if we choose a number smaller than negative 2, so let's say negative 3, We want to know if we plug it back into our inequality, is this going to be a true or, or a false statement? Um, let's just do a little bit of practice. Remember that we had that remainder theorem that said f minus 3 is the same thing as if we looked at the remainder of that factor. So if we looked at x minus 3, at the same thing. We could do 1, 1, negative 4, negative 4. So if we pull down our 1, so instead of me pulling it, putting in negative 3, wherever I see next, this could be faster. I pull down my 1, I get negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, 1 plus negative 3 is negative 2, negative 3 times negative 2 is 6, negative 4 plus 6 is 2, negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, negative 10. So if you plugged in negative 3 here, you should get back negative 10. Let's just show it real quick. If we plugged in negative 3 into x, we would have cubed that. That would have given us negative 27 
plus, we would have squared the negative three, would have, which would have given us nine, minus four times negative three, so that would have been plus 12, and then the minus four, that gives us negative 10. Okay, so. Sorry, but where did this negative three come from? Uh, I need to test values on either side of my critical numbers to see is the graph going to fall below or above the x-axis? Is it going to make my inequality true or a false statement? And so one of my values was at negative two, so I needed to test anything to the left of negative two, and I just chose negative three to be that number. So if you plug it in, you get into this inequality, you're getting negative 10. Is that strictly less than zero? And it is, that's a true statement. And so technically, we actually even know more than this. We know that this is falling below the x-axis at this point. We also know again, because of the multiplicity, that this has to be crossing the x-axis at this point. So I could test a number between negative two and negative one and I could show that that's positive. But by reasoning, I know that this is gonna go above, so this is gonna be false. Uh, negative one is another critical number, which is an x-intercept, so I know that this would be turning directions and going again below the x-axis. So that number is smaller than zero below the x-axis, this is true. Somewhere it's gonna change direction and it's gonna cross the x-axis because multiplicity is one. And so over here, this would have to be false. So me just finding one side of my intervals and knowing about the graph, I don't have to go through as much work. Um, but we could be plugging in those numbers in for x, but I just kinda of wanted to bring back something that we had learned in this chapter two where it was the remainder theorem or something similar to that. So from here, we got our solution. If you did this like this, explain to me why you're getting true, false, true, false. And I would say because multiplicity is odd. We know the graph has to cross. X axis. So our solution set would be any number you plugged in between negative infinity to negative two. Determine if you're gonna include that endpoint that set it equal to zero. Well, that set it equal to zero, so that's a false statement. Zero is not less, strictly less than zero. So parentheses, union. So we're hitting all the values between two, not two, negative one and two. That made it a true statement. If you plugged in a number, it would be negative. So parentheses, we're starting at negative one comma, we're ending it to not including, so put parentheses. I might have gone a little further <clears throat> than what this question asked. I might have said, I might have first said graph. Y equals X cubed plus X squared minus 4x minus 4. Or so we know our intercepts. We just found x intercepts when y was 0. Um, above, we found that that was x equals negative 2, negative 1 and two. The y-intercept, we can look at it by just plugging in zero for x. 
Well, you're just going to get back your constant in this case, which is negative 4. These were odd multiplicity. And we can look at end behaviors, so you should be able to find the end behaviors of a graph. So if we're looking as x is going to negative infinity, when you're looking at the end behaviors, you remember you're only looking at the leading term. So that's the term with the highest degree power and the coefficient. So we're only looking at, and this is the only thing that's affecting what's going on on my end behavior. It was odd, it's positive, plug in negative numbers, raise it to an odd power, it's negative times a positive coefficient out front. So that's gonna shoot down to negative infinity. If I look at the limit as x is going to positive infinity of x cubed, we'll plug in any positive number and raise it to a power it's positive times this positive coefficient out front is positive. So this would go to a positive infinity. Which matched up what we talked about, odd degree polynomials. The end behaviors were opposite directions. Um, and then up here, notice it also matches up to what we had just started to do. This was falling below the x-axis. It was shooting down to negative infinity as x went to negative infinity. So we can kind of put this together. And I would do a sketch a general because we can't really figure out what the max and min values where it's changing direction without a graphing a utility or calculus. But put together what you have. These are points where it was crossing the axes. We knew that as x was going down to or negative infinity, your graph was shooting downwards. We knew that above the x-axis it was crossing somewhere it turned around. It's going to come down. I don't know if it's changing direction here or over here some more, but it's going to change direction somewhere in here. And this is odd multiplicity and it had to touch or it had to cross, I mean. And then if I said find when y is less than zero. So you're looking at when is your y value smaller than zero? So that's where it's falling below the x-axis. So you can see it's in these pieces where the x values, you're always using x values. The only time you use y values are when you're looking at range or actually the max or min value. So basically y is less than zero for all x's coming from negative infinity to negative two. Then it goes above the x-axis, y is positive, and then union negative one to two. Okay, so that was kind of taking one of your, you know, let's go through and kind of pulling in a lot more of what we've learned and hopefully a good review of that stuff. So similar idea that you guys can do when you have a rational inequality, those two you had to um, find critical numbers. You had to get up that rational, that fraction, that inequality to one side, have it less than zero or greater than zero or whatever inequality. It had to be one fraction, set the numerator equal to zero. Those are where your graph would cross the x-axis. And we also had to look at when the denominator was equal to zero because those were values where the graph was either undefined or you had vertical asymptotes. And so your graph could change from being above or below the x-axis without crossing it um, when you are changing 
the x values between intercepts or in between um sorry vertical asymptotes okay so you definitely should be able to find a zero of a polynomial without being able just to look at it and factor it like we were able to do you guys good with that or do you want to look at something like that What do you think about it all? We can look at it. The zeros, finding zeros. You're good at that? No, we can. I say we could look at it. Okay. Um, so find the complex zeros of the polynomial function, right? F in factor four. So we're given that f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 9x squared minus 20x plus 20. So direction said find the complex zeros. Of f of x and rewrite F of X in factored form. So I might say rewrite that because to me that means I could write it in any factored form. Um, I would probably state that more as rewrite it in terms of linear factors and or quadratic if it's not factorable. So I'm looking at this, the first thing I would look at, can I factor this? And I notice, well, how many terms do I have? One, two, three, four, five. I don't have any tricks on five terms. And so, and I don't see that I can pull anything out and this just doesn't look like something I can factor. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna use my rule, and this is the one that you definitely need to know, the rational zero theorem. Some, I might say root, it's just interchangeable, it depends on what book, and sometimes books just go back and forth. So rate, rational zero or root theorem. This says that if you have a polynomial and you have a rational zero of that polynomial, it has to be in the form of P over Q. So it would have to be a factor of P, which is your constant. So any number that goes evenly into your constant, well, positive and negative of the factors go in evenly. And so one always goes into something evenly. Two, and I just kind of go up until I get to that, that number. So two also goes into 20, three does not, four does, five does, six doesn't, seven doesn't, eight doesn't, nine doesn't, 10 does. And the next one that would go into 20 evenly is 20. Q, Q are factors of your leading constant, your leading coefficient, sorry, leading coefficient. And so it's always nice when your leading coefficient is one because the only numbers that go evenly into one are plus or minus one. And so when you're looking at P divided by Q and Q is one, basically you get the same values that you would have gotten for um, just P because one divided by one is just one. So our P divided by Q values, if we have a rational um, zero of this polynomial, it would have to be one of these. It would not fall outside of this set. The thing is that this theorem doesn't tell me anything about irrational zeros, so like pi, but we're not going to have pi, square root of two, or complex numbers. But knowing these, we might be able to find those. Okay, so we got one over one is one, two over one is two, four over one is four, five over one is five, 10, and then 20. 
plus or minus. So basically we now have to just start going in and testing these numbers and hoping that when we use our synthetic division that that last number is zero. We can think about and use some of the other techniques to help us find those zeros, but um, you don't have to know them. So I could, if I wanted to, think of Descartes' rule of signs, thinking about the changing of the signs, which I said you don't have to know to do this test. So this is one sign change, this is one sign change, this is one sign change, and this is one sign change. There ends up being four sign changes here. So that tells me there's either four, four minus an even number would give me two, minus another even number would give me zero. There's, so there's either going to be four positive zeros, two positive zeros, or none. So I know if I find one, there has to be another one. Okay, so let's, I always tend to go with the smaller numbers and work up. So let's test one and see if it's a zero. If this polynomial, I would use synthetic division. So let's put the coefficients, descending order of powers down. If there's any term that is missing, make sure you put a zero in that place. But there's no term missing as we go down in descending order of powers. So we have one, negative four, nine, negative 20, and 20. So bring down one, one times one is one, negative four plus one is negative three, one times negative three is negative three, nine minus three is six, one times six is six, negative 20 plus six is negative 14, one times negative 14 is negative 14. This is not going to give me zero, so one does not work. This is where I can, if we remember the upper bound theorem, if all these numbers are positive when you're cho plugging in a positive number to test, then you know there's no other number greater than that that can be a, a zero. This is not all positive numbers, so let's jump to two. And so let's list out our coefficients, again, in descending order of powers of our variable. So 1, negative 4, 9, negative 20, and 20. Bring down your first number, multiply it by the number up here, C, which is 2. So 2 times 1 is 2. Negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. 9 minus 4 is 5. 2 times 5 is 10. Negative 20 minus 10 is negative 10. 2 times negative 10 is negative 20, yay. So that means x equals 2 is a 0. That means then I also know what a factor is. So if x equals 2 is the 0, then x minus 2 is a factor. We also know when we get zero there, we also know that this right here is a factor. And we can determine that factor by going one degree less than what we were doing above here. This here was a degree, I believe, four. So that was a degree four polynomial. So one degree less, that would mean this is starting at an x cubed. So those are coefficients in front of my terms, descending order of powers, starting with an x cubed. So I also know that x cubed, 1x cubed minus 2x squared plus 5x minus 10 is also a factor. So if it ever gets to a point where this here, which is also called our quotient, because if we did all wrong division, is something that you know how to factor, then you don't have to go through and use this P over Q to start testing. So notice so far, we can rewrite this, this function, f of x. Thank you. Let me just rewrite what f of x was down here. Um, so we had had f of x was equal to 
x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 9x squared minus 20x plus 20. We just found that x minus 2 was a factor. So we could rewrite f of x as x minus 2 all times the factor x cubed minus 2x squared plus 5x minus 10. I notice four terms in the second factor, and I noticed that factoring by grouping would work. If you didn't not notice that, then you would go back and you would continue doing your p over q, but you would do it on this lower degree so that it keeps on going down by one. Doing your p over q, looking at this, you could exclude values. 20 wouldn't work because your factor of your constant doesn't have 20 in it anymore. You know one doesn't work because if it worked for the original, um, doesn't work for the original, it can't work for that. It is possible though that two could be have multiplicity more than one. So it could be that this x minus two is another factor. So to save time and use techniques that you know, let's factor this by grouping. And so I noticed that we can pull x squared out of the first two terms, leaving you an x minus two. And then 5x minus 10, you can pull out a positive 5 out of those two terms, so x minus 2. Let's bring down our x minus 2. So we have x minus 2 all times x minus 2. And then here we'd be left with x squared plus 5. So this x squared plus 5, to look at when this is equal to 0, I notice that there's no real number that makes that equal to zero. If I subtract five on both sides, we get x squared equals negative five. And then if we take the square root of that, we get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative five. Square root of negative one is i. So we can rewrite this as x equals plus or minus i root five. If it wanted all the zeros though, and it wanted them even the complex zeros, so zeros of f of x, we have x equals 2 with multiplicity. So I might ask you about multiplicity it's with multiplicity 2. And then x equals i root 5 and negative i root 5. So we found those zeros, and then if it said write it in factors, linear and or quadratic over the um, real numbers, it would look like this. If it wanted all linear factors, we could also do that. x minus 2 times x minus 2. This factors as x plus 5i, x minus 5i. Oops, sorry, not 5i, root 5. How about i root 5? x minus i root 5.
So upper bound and um, question about upper bound and lower bound with a test on these problems over. So I wouldn't give you like you have to know the upper bound and lower bound theorem. But basically what the upper bound theorem says is when you're doing your synthetic division, this bottom row you, you want to look at. If you're putting in positive numbers, the upper bound theorem says if this bottom row are all positive numbers or zero in there also can include as positive. If you have all positive numbers in here, then no number bigger than that could be uh, a zero of your polynomial. So that could exclude things. So if I had done this, um, um, I would know that there's another zero in here because of Descartes rule signs, first of all, because I know that there's either four, two, or um, zero positive zeros because of the alternating signs. If I hadn't done, so look at this, if I hadn't done um, this where I factored by grouping, let's say I tested two again on this bottom row, one, negative two, five, negative 10. So really quick and I should get back zero if something's gonna, something's wrong. Cause I know that that multiplicity is two. So bring down my one, two times one is two, negative two plus two is zero, two times zero is zero, five plus zero is five, two times five is 10, negative 10 plus 10 is zero. Notice that these all are positive numbers under here. And so this by the upper bound theorem says that there's no other zero bigger than two. And so that would exclude then values from my list that I have to try. The lower bound theorem, so that has to do with negative zeros. When you're plugging in negative values in for your C, you look at your bottom row. If it's alternating in signs, then that means that that's the lowest number that it could be. It doesn't work for positive numbers. So for instance, this right here is alternating in signs on the bottom row when we use two the first time, one, negative two, five, negative 10, zero. Um, but if this had, if I had noticed this was a negative number up here and this had ha occurred, I would know that that's the smallest number. And so I don't have to look at any smaller number that I had listed with my possible rational zero theorem. Other questions? So I don't know if that, that was good enough kind of review. We didn't actually, you should be able to graph rational functions. You should be able to find your asymptotes. You guys need to see that. You should be able to find holes if there's holes in that ra graphing the rational function. you had r of x is equal to x squared plus x minus 6 all over x squared minus x minus 6. So graph each rational function. It told me to follow seven steps, but we didn't talk about it with seven steps. So first step we talked about, um, finding asymptotes. I can tell here without factoring that I have a horizontal asymptote. Remember if our degrees were the same, that's how we found if it had a horizontal asymptote and if so, where. If the degrees were the same, we looked at the leading coefficient of the polynomial in the numerator all over the leading coefficient of the polynomial in the denominator and it would be y equals, because it's a horizontal line. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. 
again, that's because of the degrees being the same. If it has a horizontal asymptote, it doesn't have a slant asymptote. And so now we're going to look at vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes depends on what sets the denominator equals zero, but not also the numerator. And so to find the vertical asymptotes, it's helpful to be able to factor both the numerator and denominator. And so looking at this, we have r of x equals two numbers that multiply to a negative six and adds to a positive one. Well, that would be x plus three, x minus two, all divided by, so this also factors two numbers that multiply to negative six and add to negative one. So in this case would be x minus three, x plus two. So there's no factor in common with the numerator or denominator. So the values which set the denominator equals to zero are vertical asymptotes. And so our vertical asymptotes occur, and these are vertical lines, so when they're, they're in the form of x equals three and x equals negative two. Intercepts are also important values. And so finding our x-intercept, we can let our y value, I'm sorry, x-intercept, yeah. We let y equal zero. Or in this case, r of x equal to zero. So we have zero is equal to our numerator x plus three in factor form all times x minus two all over x minus three x plus two. We talked about when we're dealing with rational functions and we're trying to find when this is equal to or crossing the x-axis, um, we really just have to look at when the numerator is equal to zero. If I'm solving an equation like this, I can clear my fraction by multiplying by my denominator. And so I'm looking at when is x plus three equal to zero or when is x minus two equal to zero. And so that occurs when x is negative three and when x is two. So these are points, not intercepts. So we have a point at negative three, zero, and we have a point at two, zero. So the y-intercept, you're gonna let x equals zero. So we're gonna look at r of zero. In this case, it might look be easier if you plugged it back into the original. Because if you plug it back in the original, all of the terms with x in it go away and you're just left with the coefficients, the constants mean. So we have negative six left in the numerator when you plug in zero and you have a negative six left in the denominator. So I can see that this is gonna cross at the point when x is equal to zero, y is one. Okay, so again, just now we're gonna graph it. We're gonna graph important pieces that we just found. So we found that we had a horizontal asymptote. I believe it was at one. So let's put a dotted line there. Graphs can cross horizontal asymptotes. They can cross slant or oblique asymptotes. They can never cross a vertical asymptote x equals three, so one, two, three, was a vertical asymptote. x equals negative two was a vertical asymptote. And then we had intercept at zero, one, a white intercept. Oops, wrong place, that's zero, negative one. Um, and then we had an x-intercept at negative three, zero, and two, zero. Technically, we know what type of intercepts these are. The factor only occurred once. 
So I know that it's actually going to be crossing the axes here. And so if that's the case, and it has to cross here, and I have a vertical asymptote here, I know that it's going to be coming down here. Ah. And then it's going to come up here, and it's going to start hugging this line. Same sort of idea here. Um, I know that it has to cross here, and since I have a vertical asymptote here, it would come down in here. It is possible. It could come back down and dip here. The thing is, I know that there's no x-intercept between um, this vertical asymptote. I didn't find it. And so there's no way I can dip back down and hug the vertical asymptote down below here. So I actually have to come back, I have to come up. So it's kind of like a um, cubic shape a little bit. And then I need to determine on the other side of my vertical asymptote, what does my graph look like? Is it above or below the x-axis when x is bigger than three? Again, I can use kind of knowledge of where my intercepts are and where my asymptotes are. I could actually even use knowledge. I think that this is an odd function. And if you notice this while we're doing this, maybe not, maybe it's not odd. It looked like it was odd for a second. Um, but if you plug in numbers bigger than four, you'll see that you get a number that's above the x-axis, and so you'll see that it looks like this. Can't be, I know it can't be odd because of the shifts. Anyways. Just putting the pieces together, you can see what the graph is. Sometimes if you don't see that, just plotting one or two points on each side of an inner uh, vertical asymptotes, you can see if the graph is going to fall above or below the ax um, axis and what the shape has to look like. Okay, that's a lot of chapter five. I think we got through most of chapter five, and that was. Um, then was chapter six. So I'm kind of just quickly read through what you need to know from chapter six. And if you wanted to go through, this is the back of the book or back of the chapter, starting on page 510. So I'm just going to read through the objectives really quickly of what you need to know. Um, so you should be able to form a composite function. So that was finding f of g of x. So if you knew what f of x was and g of x was, going back and plugging in g of x wherever you saw an x and f of x, you should be able to find the domain and the range of a function, determine whether a function is one-to-one, -one, obtain a graph of an inverse function from a graph of a one-to-one -one function, verify a function as an inverse, so showing that the composition of a function and its inverse either direction is equal to x, um, evaluate exponential functions, graph exponential functions, define the number e. We didn't talk about that. Um, we just know that it's about 2.718, so don't worry about that. Solve an exponential equation, yes. Change exponential statement to a logarithmic statement and a logarithmic statement to an exponential statement. That's really just helpful knowing the definition and being able to go back and forth when you're solving logarithmic equations. Once you get it in that form log equals something, you can rewrite it in exponential form and a lot of times it just comes out really nicely. Evaluate logarithmic expressions, determine the domain and the range of a logarithmic, graph a logarithmic function, solve logarithmic equations, work with properties of logs, write logarithmic expressions as a sum or difference of logs, so being able to take a really difficult log and being able to rewrite it as a sum or difference of simpler logs, which is something very helpful in Calc 1. Um, write a logarithmic expression as a single log. So if we have a sum of multiple logs, we're writing it as one log, and that's helpful for us when we're solving logarithmic equations. Evaluate a log whose base is neither 10 or E. Solve logarithmic equations, solve exponential equations, solve logarithmic and exponential equations. And then we got into 
the word problems. And so you should know exponential growth, exponential decay, and investment type of problem. Okay. I'm gonna see if, let me pull this, cause I think there's some really good ones. I don't think this was our log test. So I'm just going back to the reviews that are posted on Canvas. Some of this stuff was on the other test, but there's great stuff for the final. I thought we had logs somewhere in here. the beginning of the other test. Oh, here we go. So I'm just going to grab a couple of these. I thought I grabbed a new page. Okay. Yeah, I know we don't have very much time. Um, so looking at this, you guys should be able to graph exponential log functions. There probably is some sort of a shift in there. And so knowing about your parent function or that general shape of the exponential v to the x power where b is bigger than one or between zero or one, or knowing about the base of your log and the direction that is, and knowing about the asymptotes. So you should be able to do number nine and 10 right here. Um, I am gonna jump to the log one. Okay, so basically right here, let's just talk about this. So natural log, log is log base E. So we know our base here is E. E is a number bigger than one. And so that kind of should clue you in the general shape of that log function. When it's bigger than one, it's an increasing function. We have a vertical asymptote at the Y axis. We cross at zero, one, I'm sorry, one, zero, and then it starts increasing. So this is just y equals natural log of x. And so now we can start forming transformations. And so remember we do um, horizontal shifts first, then we do any transformations, and then we do vertical shift. And so I notice a couple of things. I see this negative in here with the X, and then I also see this negative one. And so this minus one, this is gonna shift my graph 
to the right one units. So if I shifted everything to the right one unit, my new vertical asymptote is not going to be the y-axis anymore. It's going to be uh, x equals 1, and it's going to look similar to this. That negative in front of the x, that changes the x value. If I'm changing my x value, that's changing a reflection across the y-axis. So this minus in here, this is a reflection across the y-axis. And so doing this and writing out your steps, what you're kind of thinking, or you don't even have to write out each one, that's helpful so that I can give you partial credit and you just giving me what the graph looks like. Um, so a reflection, that would change my vertical asymptote that was at x equals 1 is now at x equals negative 1. My point here that was at 2, 0 is now going to be over here at negative 2, 0. Looks like this. And then last but not least, the plus 2 out here, this shifts my graph up 2 units. So that's not going to change anything when I'm shifting up. It's not changing my asymptote, vertical asymptotes. It's just going to change this point. So think of this point that was at negative 2, 0. Now it's going to be at negative 2, 2. If I get something that looks like this. And so that would be our g of x. So graph g of x, what is the domain and range of g of x? Well, I can see that by just looking at it now that I had graphed it. My domain of g of x, well, it's all x values coming in from negative infinity all the way to my vertical asymptote, but not touching it, which was at negative 1, not including. My range are all y values, so negative infinity to infinity. Let's say, though, I asked that and you didn't graph it and you didn't really want to graph it, or you didn't know how to graph it and you wanted to get some partial credit, you should be able to find that domain by looking at that. Remember, when you're dealing with logs, you can't take a log of a negative number. And so looking at this, I could give you a question that says find the domain of this log function. You would have to say, okay, well, what we're taking the log of, in this case, negative x minus 1, has to be bigger than 0. So now if I solve this inequality, that would give me my domain. So if I added 1 to both sides, I get negative x is greater than 1. I'm divide by a negative. I have to be careful. I need to switch my sign of my inequality. So this is now less than negative 1, which is what I said here by just looking at the graph. Okay. So what is the equation of the asymptotes um, of g of x? Well, it's a vertical line. We said, stated that it was a vertical line here and it was at x equals 1, negative 1. So find the inverse function and then graph it. OK, so this is also a great problem. Um, so finding the inverse function. Let's just rewrite g of x. Let's rewrite it in terms of y equals instead of g of x equals. And so we got y equals the natural log, parentheses, negative x minus 1, and parentheses, plus 2.
So remember, finding inverse functions, we swapped our x and our y value. So swapping x and y, we get x is equal to the natural log of negative y minus 1 in parentheses plus 2. So we want to solve for y. So let's isolate the natural log. So let's subtract 2 on both sides. We subtract 2 on both sides, we get x minus 2 equals the natural log of negative y minus 1. Well, let's think about this and let's think about what we, how we could rewrite this in exponential form. So logs, the base, e, our answer is, is actually the exponent. So this is saying e raised to the x minus 2 has to equal whatever you're taking the log of, in this case, is negative y minus 1. Get y by itself. We can add one to both sides. We get e to the x minus 2 plus 1 equals negative y. Multiply through by negative 1. So we get y is equal to negative e x to the negative 2 power minus 1, which is our g inverse of x. And so from there, we can graph it. So we can graph it by plotting points and doing um, shifts. But if you've already graphed the, the function and you want to graph the inverse function, remember we can use properties of graphs. We can, or graphs of functions and their inverses. All we'd have to do is just swap our x and our y values. And so technically, right here, if I look at my, just, my g of x graph, we had a vertical asymptote at negative 1, and we had a point at negative 2, negative, sorry, negative 2, 2. And then we had something that came down like this. And so if I know this point here, which was at negative 2, 2, out on g of x for g inverse of x, that would be 2, negative 2. I know that I have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. So basically that switches, and now I have a horizontal asymptote then at x, um, y equals negative 1. If you also remember, they are reflections. Let's see. What else do we know? I know that that shifted down one. I know that this is shifted to the right two. I know, let me just think about this. If this is a negative three, and this is, let's say th three, I know it's not three. It's a negative three. It's going to be going downwards. I guess I'm having a harder time doing it this way, but it's going to look like this. And if you look at it and you look at your line y equals x, another thing we know about inverse functions, and you can kind of check it is that they're symmetrical across the line y equals x. And this is off a little bit. 
And if you flip it, you'll see that they start to lie on each other. If I didn't know and I didn't want to do it based off the original function, then I can start naming off shifts that's going on in here. This is G inverse of X. Okay, so I wanted to at least get through one of those to see real quick. And I figured um, when I asked you to graph a log or an exponential and then found asked you to find the inverse, that might might have freaked you out without looking at one recently. Okay, so tomorrow we're gonna meet here at one. And then um, so I will um, have an assignment open on Canvas, but don't click on it until you meet in class. And then once class has started, the assignment's gonna open on Canvas that you can click on it that will say test two. If you try to click on it before, it will tell you that it, you're too early, that it's not available yet. Um, you'll have your webcam on while you're taking the exam. Um, and it will be on you taking the exam. So if you have a printer at home, you're going to just, um, when I let you open up the exam, you're going to just go print it off. You can step away from the computer and the webcam for a moment while you get the, the test. If you don't have a printer at home, it's not the end of the world. All you're going to do is you're going to just take the first page of the test. You're going to just write it out and then write out your solutions. And then after you're done with the exam, you're not going to log out of the test you're going or the class. You're going to private message me saying that you're done with the exam and that will flag me that I know that you're done and then you're going to um, scan the exam and upload it to an assignment that will be available for Canvas and that's where you would have gotten the test anyways. And you're going to upload the test as a single PDF. And once you've gotten that uploaded to the Canvas um, site, then you can log out of class. If you have a problem with getting it for some reason up, uploaded as a single PDF, then you can let me know and then we can talk about it and figure out what's going on and how you can get me the exam. So any questions? Yes. So I will consider, yes, I will move the, the um, assignments that are due today that we're not having covered on the exam to Monday. Unfortunately, you guys are going to have that, that chunk of homework that we do next week, that those three sections that are going to be due on the day of the final. And you know, you're going to want to do those just so that you have had some practice for that test. Um, so I will move everything from chapter 12 11. If anything of that was due today, I'll move that to Monday. Any other questions? Can we use a calculator on the test? I will let you use the calculator on the exam. Okay, let me pause this, stop the recording. <laughs>